Jane, thanks for coming back on. Hi, good to see you. Yeah. Um, so let's see. We talked on record with Chris a little while ago, but this is our first one-on-one -on -one conversation on the podcast since I had you on, I think it would have been last August. And uh, yeah, it's nice to catch up on record. I feel like so much has happened in our lives and our friendship and feels feels like a nice moment to catch up about that and share some things. I know there's there's several things I'm hoping to talk to you about. So um, yeah, thanks for coming on. Mm. Yeah, that's kind of wild that that was less than a year ago. I feel like I'm always like, how long have I known you? Like 10 years, 50 years? <laughs> yep. Yes. Oh, like a year and a half. Okay. okay. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Maybe just like a lot happens in our, our friendship and our lives since we've known each other. It feels like longer. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I think that um, sort of practically speaking, I'm aware that maybe, maybe like two big things I think happened. One is you finished your massage program. And then we lived together for like, I don't know, was it like six weeks or something like that that we lived together? It sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think that the, those things are like living together and some massage stuff is, I don't know, some of the things I'm hoping to kind of ask you about and talk more about on this, this episode and we can see where it goes from there. But um, does that sound cool. good? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So maybe for starters, um, when we lived together, you were like, oh, I wanna be practicing massage. So could I maybe possibly, I know this is inconvenience, but like give you some massages if you have time. And I was like, oh geez, let me think about that for like zero whole seconds. Like, yes, absolutely. Uh, and uh, what, you know, it, it was a real gift and a treat and a privilege to get massages from you. and. Um, I, I kind of, you know, basically I want to rave about that on record and talk about how amazing that was because um, I think that that experience of getting massages from you, like uh, in the parlance of our corner of Twitter, massage pilled me. Uh, it was like, yes, massage is good and I should get massages regularly. And since then I've gotten two professional massages and it's like, yes, this is a good thing to be doing. And they were not the Jane Caliber massage that oh. I was privileged to have when we lived together. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's super sweet to hear that. Thank you. And I will be using this clip as a video <laughs> testimonial on my website, FYI. Excellent. <laughs> no. I mean, I would love to have you write one, but or do a video or something. But um, yeah, that's super nice to hear. And I'm thrilled to hear if I massage pill anyone. It's definitely like, um, yeah, whether it's from me or somebody else, I would just love for more people to know about the like incredible healing potential of massage. And uh, yeah, I mean, you and I talked a lot. I think I, I think I gave you two massages in that time. And I think we would have like talked about it right afterward, like some of like the details of like what you liked and didn't like and and um kind of like what impact it would have had on you in the coming days but yeah I would just love to hear more about like what you liked so much about them what was kind of different when you went out and got massages from others after we yeah after we stopped living together mm -hmm. yeah definitely I think um yeah those really bleed into each other for me like what was so good about the massages that you gave me and like what was just like noticeably different or, or really I'd say like lacking about getting professional massages elsewhere I think to some extent that might be mitigated by like you know since I travel I'm like just finding random places and like going there once and if I had like an ongoing relationship with someone then I think some of it would be mitigated but mm -hmm. um you know maybe yeah maybe just to contrast like it's like okay I I, I am 
persuaded like, oh, massage is really good for me. It's good for me physically, but also emotionally and psychologically from the experiences that we had together. And like, I kind of thought that abstractly before I was like, yeah, massage is good. But then like, I was like, oh, like it's very good. And I should do massages regularly. And I almost think of it at this point as like my treat to myself. It's like, I'm going to go get massages periodically because this is really, really good for me. And um, yeah. And so because I travel, I like just find these places here and there that I've been able to, when I've had time to book them. And it's just felt um, very impersonal. And uh, like, I don't know the people beforehand. In both cases, actually, there was like a language barrier of like, the person didn't speak English and, as well. And like, um, but also, I think more importantly, like, they don't know me, I don't know them. And there's not this like sense of safety and trust. And in particular, the thing that was most jarring for me is um, I'm, I'm sort of like, you know, like several years ago, people were getting really into biomotive in Twitter and like there was like the sob squad meme going around. I'm kind of like renewedly on the sob squad where because um, there's there's kind of like two angles to that. It's like, oh, crying is good. And it's like bad that crying is not welcome. And in, in when I got massages from other people, it was like, I would start crying because I've done so much biomotive and like there's physical emotional release happening through the massage and the massage therapist would be like are you okay like is everything okay like there's a man crying on my massage table like this is irregular this is bad and um I was like wow. no I'm okay and I'm like I'll let you know if I need something if this hurts or like whatever and they'd be like are you sure really and um even though I would say that it just wouldn't feel as safe to cry and release um, through the massage. And so I would like kind of hold back the crying a bit more. And yeah, I just did not feel that with you. It was like, I already knew you. I trust you. I feel safe around you. We're friends. I could feel like love from you, like that you care about me. And, um, you know, and I was just explicit with you, like, Hey, I'm going to cry when I get a massage and that's good. And you like already know what biomotive is and certainly do emotional processing yourself and so you're like yeah like bring it on <laughs> you're not like oh is there a problem <laughs> like this is the good stuff actually and uh, I could lean into that and then and then I could like importantly I could like talk to you about what's coming up like oh I'm having this memory about this thing or like there's this feeling of dread all of a sudden right I don't really remember the details it was it felt very psychoactive and like psychedelic really like I was just very surprised it felt like I was like tripping on something, but you know, it's totally sober, but just because I could really lean into the qualities of release from the massage in your presence and through your touch, like I could really just go for it and cry and release and relax my muscles. And then things happen of their own accord because I could really go there. And um, I think that just, you really like created a space for that where that was okay. And um, I think to some extent our friendship did too, but I, I imagine even if someone wasn't as close to you that you would really show up in that same way of like using it as a basis for emotional, psychological, like healing and, and transformation and that being a context. And so, yeah, for me, it was like, um, I, I made this like tweet about it afterwards. I was like, let me just tell you, like if you could get a tweet from a, a massage from Jane, like just go for it. And that's that's very much how I feel coming out of it is like, yeah, I'm gonna get massages from other people. They're still really good. They have like, I don't know, like I went to actual like spas where they have like various appurtenances for massage and that's good. But um, you know, uh, I hands down any day of the week rather choose a massage from you because I can actually feel safe to use that for like psychological emotional healing in a way that I might not just showing up at some random place and uh, for the first time and yeah to some extent that might be mitigated by like a, re a recurring relationship with a massage therapist but still uh, yeah Jane's massages have a special place in my heart and in this very tense body well thanks for thanks for going into all that detail it's really nice to hear I think it's like there are a lot of different ways to go with massage and what you're describing is basically, I think exactly kind of like my niche and like what, what I seem to be um, trying to do as a massage therapist. And it's, yeah, it's really nice that we like 
match so well that way together like obviously we're already really good friends and have a lot of love for each other but also like the type of massage that you're looking for is exactly the type that I want to be giving um I don't have anything against like more like spa relaxation focused massages but it's just never been what I've been drawn to in terms of receiving massage or giving um Mm -hmm. so yeah it's great uh I'm gonna be getting a business up and running soon and it's like a big question I have is like how do I find people like you you know like how do I build a website or whatever marketing I do in such a way that like it becomes clear that that is what the type of massage experience that I want to give people so Mm. it's really nice that it it resonated so much for you Mm. Mm. how are you thinking about that now like with the copy and stuff like that or how to approach advertising it yeah it's it's a good question I have never done this before so I feel like I'm I have some friends with, with more experience in terms of like finding the right clients for them. And I've been talking to them. I made some, a friend of mine is helping me build the website and I made some, like a mood board yesterday of, Mm. um, basically we picked a bunch of like, we talked for a while about basically like what I want to be doing in massage and like picking a couple of words and then also talking through a little bit about like the, maybe more like words and also phrases of like what it is I'm trying to do and then pick images that feel like they kind of capture that and then we'll use those to to build the whole I don't know this is probably like design 101 but this is all kind of new to me but using these images or similar images on the website and then trying to yeah in the copy she's going to take some pictures for me too of me massaging and just um try to make it super clear through the copy and also just the whole mood and vibe of the site Hmm. um that like yeah this is like a I like how you described it emotional healing emotional psychological kind of yeah full body mind spirit healing um experience that I'm trying to give Mm -hmm. and yeah like I guess what were some of the words that I was thinking of calm, safe, healing, pioneering, expansive. Um, You, you, you touched on it a little bit when you talked about like certain memories coming up and things, but a big part of my life right now is um, using the imaginal practice sort of as a therapy modality and more. I talked about it a little bit in a podcast with Chow Chu um, and I'm in a group of people who are all really into using the imaginal practice for for various things, including healing, but not limited to healing. And um, I see a lot of overlap between that and massage. So it's also about, um, yeah, I kind of want to bring that possibility and potential into, um, into, into the massage space. Sometimes it makes sense to not really talk and have the whole thing be pretty nonverbal, but sometimes I think it's really helpful to talk a lot about what's coming up and to kind of use like, um, use imaginal space as well where like it's a little hard to describe but it could almost be like us communicating non-verbally not just through the touch but like transmitting images to each other Mm. through the touch and Mm. the massage um in ways that can be really healing Mm. wow wow that's so interesting I, i definitely want to try that next time i get a chance to get a massage from you um it occurs to me that there might be like some dimension of like almost like client education on your part where you like have to like yeah there's like finding people that are good fit but also like informing them of how you work and like helping them to gain the skills that they might need to like most effectively work with you or something like that in a way that like if you were just like relaxing their muscles in a like very physical way that you might not need to do but there might be a more like client onboarding experience or something like that yeah yeah it'll be really interesting to see like um yeah I imagine there won't be tons of people coming to me being like hey I'm really interested in the intersection of massage and imaginal can we explore that together you know but like for me I would say one of my first like one of my first imaginal experiences like 
that I really remember kind of spontaneously arose while I was getting a massage. It just sort of like started, all this stuff started like playing out in my mind, like involving like inner child stuff. And so, yeah, I could definitely see like it being something that starts to unfold and that, um, yeah, we kind of talk about exploring together beforehand. And then if I have, like, I have a blog post about self-massage and that could be something where it's like, oh yeah, this is something you could work on on your own at home in between sessions. Like I also like to think of um, if people can be doing a lot for a lot of like self-healing type work, then we are able to go that much deeper in sessions. I definitely found that when I started getting massages, I was like, oh, if I don't like (laughs) sit at a computer for 10 hours straight, not moving most days between massage Mm -hmm. sessions, (laughs) we won't have to spend so much at the massage. Uh (laughs) Like, you know, working out all of this stuff that we worked out last session, redoing that. If I take care of myself better in between sessions, we can go into this like deeper, older stuff. Um, so yeah, I, this is all still very new to me of how I'm going to be approaching this and what the, what my relationship with clients will be like and what being an entrepreneur will be like and all of that. But yeah, I think you're probably right that there will be some sort of, and I'm sure there will be like, it will grow into a lot of things that I don't foresee now, you know, I think there will be so much exploration and learning from Mm -hmm. clients on, on my end as well. Yeah. When you said like, oh, they're might not be people coming to you that want to explore the connection between massage and imaginal practice it like reminded me of ways that I've heard people talk about meditation and mindfulness before the like mindfulness boom and like the kind of resurgence and interest in Buddhism in the west and um, Mm -hmm. I mean now you know people do mindfulness meditation all over the place in like all kinds of contexts and it's like kind of an understood thing at this point but um even though imaginal practice and massage and the connection between those things or like the different self-therapy modalities and stuff like that are still like not evenly distributed it it sort of like occurred to me oh if you fast forward five or ten or fifteen years in a future in a world where like Jane is doing this kind of work and other people are doing this kind of work like it could be totally normal that in like five, 10, 15 years, people are like, Jane, like you are the expert in massage and imaginal practice. Like, let me pay you a thousand dollars to get time with your very limited schedule uh, (laughs) because it's in such demand by so many people. And like, uh, I don't know, it, it, it seems very possible that that could happen if you fast forward five, 10, 15 years, something like that. Yeah, I love that idea. I'm on board with imaginal practice becoming huge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, maybe, maybe just like in the in the immediate present, something that these experiences with getting massages from other people has made me wonder about is like how you approach um, getting massages, like when you get massages yourself. And I know that you've talked about like. That you had like a recurring relationship with a massage therapist in in Asheville, I think, and uh, you would go to see him periodically. And um, I don't know. I, I it's in retrospect, it seems to me like you need a like I at least need, and I imagine other people need like a sense of safety and trust and, and like yeah, like love, um, like being loved and like accepted in order to like have a good massage on the kinds of dimensions that you and I care about and um you know like the sort of physical releases and like massage is fine but to like really let it be a a healing experience psychologically and emotionally like you need a sense of safety and love and trust and like mutual understanding I think and you and I could just go there when you started giving me massages because we already had that but I it makes me wonder like how you approach Um, you know, say you move somewhere in the next few months and like set up, you know, getting licensed and, you know, and whatnot, like, how are you going to approach finding a therapist yourself and like building that relationship? And and what advice would you give to someone that is like going to get a massage from someone? Yeah, it's such a good question. And I just had like all of these, like all of these different Mm -hmm. ideas come up as you were asking. Um, Yes, I had a consistent 
therapist in Asheville. And then I've been moving around different parts of New Mexico um, for the last like five months. But I actually also have a consistent massage therapist here in Santa Fe. And I just like, um, I, since living in Santa Fe, I've been in other parts, mostly Taos, which is a little over an hour from Santa Fe. And I will still like drive down to Santa Fe to see her, to get massages from her because like, it's so worth it to me. Um, now that I, yeah, have like a known really amazing healer in the vicinity, you know, within 90 miles or something like, Mm. yeah, I just, I am going to see her this week. I'm super excited. Um, so Yes, I think that like the the safety thing is a huge aspect and people don't talk about it that much. And it's not that it's impossible for somebody to make you feel that way right off the bat, right upon meeting them. I think that it is possible to feel very safe and loved and seen and accepted by somebody right away. But there are a lot of factors involved. Um, there is just something about like a personal fit. I mean, I think with like regular therapy, like it's the same thing, right? Like just some people are going to be right for you and some people aren't. And there's something like, it doesn't mean that person is not a good therapist if they're not a good fit for you, but there is some amount of just like experimentation and trying different people that I think I tried so many different people in Asheville before I found the right person. And that's hard. It's time consuming. It's expensive. And, um, yeah, it just takes a lot of time and energy. And I think a lot of people, until you've experienced like a really, really good transformative massage, you also just like, don't know that that's possible. So you might get an okay massage and be like, is that it? Was that, maybe that was a really good massage. Like maybe massage isn't really right for me. I don't know. People seem to rave about it, but that just seemed okay to me. It was pretty good. It felt good. Yeah. <laughs> getting touched feels good. Getting touched. It's fine. Feels good. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think if it like doesn't seem great, it's probably worth trying to still find other people. And then like what I was describing before with how I'm trying to build my site, I mean, it didn't take me as long to find the right person in Santa Fe as it did in Asheville. And I don't know, am I getting better at like telling the vibe from the site or was it luck? I don't know. But like um, having a really good sense now of this type of like the like emotional healing kind of atmosphere that I want in the session and like a really warm loving person I mean I I think I probably got a really good feeling from her page when I first went to it and it felt like you know it had a similar vibe to what I'm looking for in a session um for other people you might be looking for something else you might be looking for somebody who's like almost more on like the physical therapy side of massage or like a sports massage or really deep tissue massage or or whatever the case may be so having some sense of um of what you're looking for which can also take some experimentation too a lot of times if you go to one of these spas that have a lot of people on staff they have like a whole menu of different types of massages that you could that you could try and start to get a little bit of a better sense of what it is that you're looking for. And again, I know that that can get really expensive to like dabble around in and experiment a lot, but um, yeah, different people are really drawn to different types of massages and different types of massage therapists. Um, I feel like there's this whole like other element of like, um, it's really interesting to see what comes up with a massage therapist. Like, let's say you find a really good massage therapist, but then you notice there are these ways that you're still holding back a little bit, or like you have some kind of like, um, it's almost like it can be a good way to do shadow work or something. Um, I, I guess it's like that in regular therapy too. Like you talk about, like people talk about transference and counter transference, right? Like, um, projecting stuff onto your therapist and so it's it can be interesting to notice I guess like if there's something I'm like hesitating to give really specific examples but if there's something that's making you feel a little blocked with the person I think it can be really valuable to feel into whether like that person is just not a good fit for that reason or whether there is something there on your end that actually can be worked through and unblocked um 
and then there's also just stuff you can experiment with like um sometimes i'll take like a really small dose of like a weed edible before a massage um it like particularly in indica will like bring about just like a really mild body high that i find to be like perfect for for getting massages and like feeling into my body as much as possible and um also just changes my relationship with pain in like a uh a really helpful way um and yeah I particularly with that massage therapist in Asheville I there was one point where I just noticed that I had a lot of emotional stuff of like a specific flavor that I was having trouble expressing in those sessions and so I just like before one session I took a weed edible and it just really helped kind of like break down those specific barriers and then I don't think I kept taking edibles after that because kind of felt like it had served that specific purpose Mm. but um yeah that feels like some some ideas that I have I think there are more yeah I think it's like a whole art is like the art of like how you get massaged and how how you show up in a session and it's it's really not just like getting on the table and being like fix me (laughs) there's a there's a it's the whole thing is sort of a co-creation and a dance and a a joint a joint effort so I think there's a lot to it and that feels like kind of scratching the surface at least definitely yeah that's super helpful uh that bit about co-creation I think that when you first gave me a massage I was like oh you're the expert like whatever you think is good and like and you were like no no like you you should like talk and like tell me what you need and like tell you tell me how it feels for you or like what you want and uh I sort of that that was that was uncomfortable for me actually I think uh like oh I should express what I want and like what I need and then when I sort of leaned into that it was like part of what made it so good was just to be able to share what I wanted or needed and uh not so much on the <clears throat> physical level but just like I found it really useful to be like yeah I think I'm actually going to just talk at you a bunch about these memories that are coming up and like share them with you and like tell you why I'm crying or what I'm feeling and um like hear like I don't know I like asked you questions about like how it made you feel and stuff like that to like hear the things that I said and like you were just like when it was like circling almost uh and like Mm. I think you really went there with me and it was like I think this is what I need right now and like it's not a thing that I would have expected beforehand is like because I I know I hadn't gotten a massage before and um I think that that makes me think too like you mentioned oh it's really expensive and uh it's like it is an investment in money and, and that's true I, I think um, I, getting the kinds of massages that I got from you really shifted how I saw this because um, before I was like, oh, this is like a luxury item. And like, why would people do that for themselves? And like, why would you spend money on this? And like, oh, like I have limited money and I should spend it on the things that I actually need or something like that. And um, I don't know, now I see it as like just such a good investment that it's like very worth it. and. I feel similarly about like you and I talked on the first episode about like coaches and like, I think coaches just like really level up your possibility space for different areas. And it really seems to me that like, when I get a massage, I know like almost on a very like practical level, I'm going to feel so much better in my body for like days, if not weeks after that massage. And like, that's going to reverberate through all of the things that I do where I'm like more emotionally at ease and like more energized for doing the things that I care about and like better able to serve the world and it seems like such a good investment from that perspective but also like on the deeper level like if I'm able to release something that is like stuck in my emotional system and like might not come out otherwise uh, which really does seem to be the case I mean I have all of these self-therapy modalities and like meditation techniques and tricks that I can use on myself but like there's something about being massaged by someone else that like just zooms in on the things you wouldn't be able to get to yourself that you wouldn't even notice yourself it's just like oh wow I'm like suddenly crying about this memory from three years ago that I'd totally forgotten about like um that just seems like such a good investment to me that it's like the um like just very obviously worth it to me now, which is a very different attitude than I might have had before. Yeah, I'm really glad that you brought this up. Um, 
yeah how does it feel like it would have been different if like you had had some of those like memories and emotions and things surfacing and like we didn't talk about it versus like you being able to talk through it and like kind of how you described a little bit of circling to you like yeah I'm curious to hear I know it's a hypothetical but like you know it's actually interesting because this reminds me of something else that I wanted to talk to you about of like I've been noticing some themes recently I've been able to do some Alexander technique training here and um, with Peter who I had on the podcast and then also this other person and uh, even some hands-on work from Michael and um, that was great and I Michael Ashcroft yes yep um, and in the Alexander technique stuff I've noticed similar things that came up, I think in our massages and other massages and definitely other contexts, like totally different contexts of my life where there's like this very specific theme that comes up. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a second, but it's like, yeah, what comes to mind is if we weren't able to talk at the massage, I would have the ability to like sort of emotionally process and take care of myself in like a limited way where it's like, you know, I can do meta for myself or like talk to my different parts or like cry through it with biomotive or something like that. Um, and that would be okay. But a lot of what the like content of the thing is about like how I'm being perceived by someone else. And so just the fact that I could like ask you, like, how are you perceiving me right now? And like, what is this like for you? Sort of gave me actual accurate information from the real person that I was like, basically like worrying how I was being perceived. I think um, typically in coaching or therapy modalities that involve the body, uh, anything really that involves the body, like exercise, like it's very easy for shame to come up about my body where it's like my, um, and I've written about it, a bit about this on Twitter, but like my self body image is very different than the physical image that I see when I look at my body now or like look in a mirror or something like it's just there's just a total mismatch and then um like lots of fears come up about that and how I'm being perceived and like um am I being seen as like weak or ugly or like br th this flavor of like broken and hopeless has come up from like a biomotive perspective like like, oh, feelings of being broken and hopeless. And like, I'm just, um, you know, like, I mean, it's tricky because in these therapy modalities, it's like, yeah, we are trying to help you. And there is some kind of like blockage or some kind of thing that's not working for you. But like, does that mean you're fundamentally broken? Like abstractly in reasoning, like, no, it's just like everyone has these things and, you know, it's different for different people, but like, you're not uniquely broken or like, irrevocably flawed or something but like emotionally in my system it's like oh no I am bad and broken and like I will never be able to fix these things because this other person sees this thing and I don't and I don't know how to fix this for myself and like that means that I'm like bad and um, like ugly and like weak and small and like that doesn't feel very good emotionally to like be in that heart space and um, it's like yeah, I can like send myself meta or talk to my parts or like, you know, cry through it. But like, because it's an interpersonal feeling, it really helped to be able to be like, you know, uh, I think I asked you like, like, yeah, how are you perceiving me now? And like, or, yeah, I asked if you were judging me at all. Like, do you experience any judgment of me right now? Which is like, I guess like, I mean, it felt vulnerable to ask that and maybe it was vulnerable to answer, but like, it was a thing that I expected you would know, like, are, are you in your experience judging me right now or not? And you were like, no, I'm not judging you. And because of our friendship, I knew you wouldn't lie to me. And like, if you had said you were judging me, like that would have been hard, but we would have like felt through that or something. And like, you were just like, no, I'm not judging you at all. Like I, in a, not in a defensive way, it was like, just very honest and like real. And I could feel that in my body and like, that was that was relieving in a way that just taking care of myself internally would never have been relieving yeah yeah there's something there that like so much of like feeling our feelings fully and releasing the stuff that we weren't able to feel and process through at the time or like receive acceptance about at the time it's like 
if like we're if you're getting it if i'm imagining myself if i'm getting a massage and i'm like trying to like process through all this stuff that's coming up but i still don't really feel like i can like fully talk about it and like be accepted and seen by the person who's working on me it's like not that much better than like the original time that it happened you know yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. it's almost like I'm trying to like hide here and secretly yes. do some emotional processing without actually being like seen in it or like Ooh. not you know trying not to be too much or something which is like so counterproductive to the whole thing like yeah I think a big part of the healing is like somebody seeing you and accepting you and like being really loving with you as you're just like very very open about what's happening in your in your in your experience um yeah i specifically remember the the instance that you're talking about too and it felt very important to share like judgment is a hard word too right because like there's this whole thing about like judgment versus discernment and like mm -hmm. As a massage therapist, like part of my job is to note where there are areas of tension in your body, right? It's like find them, note them, like have some sort of like, not like really like um, exact kind of routine that I'm going to go through or something, but it's like, okay, I'm going to come back to the left calf. Like there's some tension here that, you know, there's something here that wants some attention. So like, I don't know if that would be considered a judgment, but it's like, I remember wanting to make it clear to you, like my job here is to note the tension and like work with it, but there's absolutely no judgment in terms of like what um, the way that people's bodies look and feel when they come to me. It's like, mm -hmm. it's, I'm, it's such a deep honor that people will come and be vulnerable with me in that way. Like it's incredibly vulnerable to like show up with your, um like covered but naked body mm -hmm. and um not just do that but not be guarding either because you can go into a massage and guard you know um I don't I think that people do that without realizing it sometimes where there's something emotional coming up and they're they don't really want it to and so they tense a little bit or like mm -hmm. there are just other things that are uncomfortable and, and vulnerable for them that they tense against. But so to show up with your body exactly how it is and, and um, be very open to receive all of the healing that's available is like just such an incredible act of vulnerability and strength that, that I'm very moved by. And so I remember trying to get that across to you in your answer that like, yeah. Hmm. It definitely came through. In that through. sense, absolutely no judgments, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it makes like, me think people too, have all yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just just that like the fact that I could ask that question and that you could answer, like that feels like yeah, I mean I was talking about earlier about like how I, I can't even really feel comfortable crying with other massage therapists. Even if I say beforehand, oh, I'm gonna cry and this is okay and this is normal for me, it doesn't mean there's a problem. Like just I can feel in their body language and then their voice that when I do cry, it's like oof, like there's a problem. There's a man crying. This is an anomaly. Like this is not good. And like, that feels like just so like, that's like elementary to me. I cry literally, probably literally every day at this point to release different emotions. It's like very good and healthy for me. And it's like totally normal. So how could I, if, if that's not safe, like how could I possibly ask a question? Like, are you judging me right now? Like, and receive a real answer there or like even other things and it's like yeah I think you just created so much space like interpersonally for like the exploration that would be of most benefit yeah yeah that's great um so much of my I mean the, the reason I got really into massage and decided to pursue it in the first place is how healing receiving massage has been for me and it, it's been such an emotional experience for me and so it's like I feel like I'm the opposite of these therapists that you're describing where mm -hmm. I'm like, this person's not crying. Is everything okay? <laughs> Do they, is this session meaningful for them at all? There are no tears. I don't like, I don't understand. <laughs> so yeah, it really is like, yeah, different, different massages for different folks. <laughs> yes. 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 Absolutely. Huh. Huh. But yeah, one other comment on what we were saying before, like, I feel like, um, I don't know if the topic of like therapists judging clients in general is interesting to people, like, um, people have, uh, I'll just do a quick plug for Rosalind on Twitter and her yoga mm -hmm. program. Like something that I absolutely love about, uh, her heart of yoga program that she and her partner run together is that like, 
it very much feels like show up in your body exactly as it is today. And there's yoga available to you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Like there's some quote that they have, like anybody who can breathe can do yoga. And, Mm -hmm. um, it's there in, in the yoga culture in the U S at least at large, there's, I find can be a lot of like body, like subtle body shaming and things they are like, um, this is where you should be. This is what you're trying to get to. And, um, I love that I can just show up exactly as my body is now with all of the incredible miracles of it and all of the imperfections and dysfunction. And I think massage should be like that too. Like we have all had hard lives, you know, at varying levels of hard and it is reflected in our bodies. And it's like kind of a miracle in itself. Like if you show up with certain tension patterns and things like, congratulations, you're a human who's, <laughs> you know, like had to do difficult things with your body. Um, so yeah, mm. just wanted to tack that on too. Mm. That's so beautiful. And I think um, in any session, whether it's massage or, you know, I mentioned with Alexander technique recently, or like, I know this comes up in other areas of my life. Like, yeah, like even like, like, romantic connections it also comes up it's like um this felt sense interpersonally of what you just said of like yeah like I accept you as you are and like there's nothing uniquely bad or broken about you like that you're just a human and I care about you and I love you and you are accepted and welcomed as you are you know it's it's obviously different in different contexts like what obviously like the romantic context is very different than like a therapeutic relationship but like that feeling of being seen and accepted and loved as one is um is like so so necessary for any like real quality relationship of any kind and certainly in these like transformative therapeutic practices like really necessary for that and or for like learning to happen and Um, I think that's really going to be an open question for me of like how to work with that dynamic coming up. I I noticed in the Alexander stuff that I have had the chance to do recently that like that came through very clearly from Peter and from Michael and um, the other teacher that I worked with, but like because it was sort of a um, social setting, it was difficult to like feel the same kind of safety because even if I felt that from sort of like the teacher or the coach or whatever what have you like other people's presence sort of like altered the social dynamics there where like that feeling of safety might not be there and um I don't I don't don't know it feels really important to like work with this and it, it just seems like such a consistent pattern for me that this sort of like specific like genre of shame comes up that like I'm like familiar with it at this point but I'm I'm sort of not sure how to work with it and and like uh it can kind of be there in different intensities and it's like oh yeah that's just there and it's fine and I can like love myself as it is or do what I need to to take care of myself but it can also like really spiral where it's like oh I do not feel safe and this does not feel good and like I'm not going to be able to like heal or learn in this setting if, if this is this triggered and I'm still learning how to work with that and is it similar to what you were talking about before with like worrying about the way that people are perceiving you and not being able to like kind of address that directly or is this or is it something else that you're getting at with the shame um yeah I think uh it's like fears about how other people are perceiving me and uh not knowing how they're perceiving me and um and then also like internally a feeling of I think I think the deepest sort of core feeling is like a feeling of hopelessness and that sort of interpersonal feeling not with other people but like with myself of broken where it's like I am broken and I am hopelessly broken and I will never be whole or fixed or something like that and then this sort that's sort of like more surface superficial of like how are other people perceiving me but but if they're seeing that I'm hopeless and broken and like bad uh like that's like oof that's yeah. And again, this, it makes, you know, when you describe it verbally, it's like, that makes no sense, but, but emotionally, that is the emotional subjective reality that I experience often in these situations. And it's just like, that's like a hell realm, basically of like, like, because it, because yeah, like really like a hell realm, because it's like, it's unending. It's like, I am hopelessly broken 
and I will never be fixed. And, and that comes up, I think, because this other person is perceiving something about me that I can't perceive about myself and therefore can't fix about myself. Uh, and, uh, and, and also that has to do with my body, which I don't have, like, I, I can't control to some extent. It's just like, this is the body that I have. And so it feels like, um, just like, like, like I, I'm helpless, like I can't do something and, uh, to, to actually make a change, even if, if they're like, yeah, like I went to this Alexander Technique teacher recently and she was like, oh, you have tension in your neck and in your lower back. And like, I was really interested in how that was affecting my voice. That's like why I wanted to work with her because she's like a voice Alexander te teacher. And, um, you know, she, she was great. She was, she was, she was wonderful, but it's just like, I had this feeling of hopelessness come up of like, how am I going to work with this? And like, that stuff is so, um, so dense and detailed and takes a long time to work with. And it's like, you know, I'm only here for so long and like going to have like one or two or three sessions with her. And like, you know, probably would actually in reality need like 200 sessions with her to fix this thing or like really address it. And it's like, oh, what do I do with that? Like now I know that there's tension in my neck and lower back and I, you know, that's good. I can like learn to work with that, but like how, and uh, it just feels overwhelming and, and not so good. And that that's a very, it, you know, it's different in different contexts of what the therapy modality is or what the con context is interpersonally, but like that feeling space is like a very familiar one for me. And I'm like getting more clarity about what's actually happening there. And, I, you know, just being aware of it is probably the first step to like learning to work with it more skillfully other than the things I already do, which is like basically loving myself and loving my parts. And then like having good boundaries of like, oh, like I'm gonna, like I'll tell this person I need to leave the room or need to take some space if it's just like super triggered. Um, but uh, that's not like really transformatively healing the, the stuff that comes up there. Yeah, I appreciate you talking about that in so much detail. Yeah, it's relatable for me. And I also relate to having experiences where people are just like very direct about like other people's tension and things that just feel really like, kind of like, I'm not saying it was this way in the, the scenario you're describing, but it can just feel really like, disrespectful and like unnecessary sometimes and even just like yeah it can come across as unnecessarily critical like sometimes we don't actually need to have like all of our body tensions pointed out to us like especially stuff that has like emotional base bases or like emotional components to it it's like hey did you know that you had something hurt you as a child that is now being reflected in your neck like <laughs> cool like you know you know what I mean like it, unprompted like just it can just come across as very critical it's like the standard is like you should have no tension in your body and you're not needing that or something like I mean there's there's definitely a balance because it can be obviously very helpful to have tension shown to us that we're not fully aware of but um yeah I noticed it one time I gave a friend of mine a massage and then afterward I think she, you know, I think I asked her for feedback and then I think she asked me what I had noticed. And I, I mentioned like a couple of areas of tension that I noticed. And I noticed that with each one that I gave, like um, it seemed like she felt a little defensive and was trying to like explain them to me. And like, maybe she just seemed a little bit hurt too. And then it was, I mean, it was a really good learning experience for me because it's like, she had asked me for feedback, but clearly what I was giving her was not, um, feeling helpful to her and it was just feeling like I was pointing out things that were wrong with her or something mm -hmm. so I think um I think there are scenarios where that can be a helpful and loving thing to do and then there are scenarios where it can just be like especially when um unprovoked like when it's not specifically sought after it can just feel like somebody pointing out flaws or something and just yeah, really unproductive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I mean, I, yeah, I'm, I'm reminded of the thing I'm always on about, which is Buddhist right speech. It's like, <laughs> is this the right context to say this thing? Like this could be true and useful and it could be meant in a kind way. And even the words could be kind. Like you have tension in your neck. There's nothing mean about those words and you could say it from a kind state of mind, but it might not be the right time or context to say the thing. Like, especially like, is the person open to hearing this or like, is this something that they're wanting 
or that like they're going to be able to make use of is like very varied in a certain context or relationship that could be transformative for someone's life like absolutely yeah and in a different context that could be like so hurtful and even even like scarring you know like remembering all of the times that someone said something about your body like it's just such a vulnerable thing yeah 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 totally Mm. Mm. It feels good to share all this. I don't know. It's like pretty raw for me, but just, just being open about it is like very healing and um, uh, kind of airing it out. It's like, yeah, there's this, it's, it's, it's just so normal too. Like, like um, I, I imagine this is like not at all a unique experience. I, you know, I have this, I have this pretty commonly. It's like, oh, this is not like really a unique experience. It's more like one, the, ability to discern what's happening and to like yeah that I'm sort of talking about this is is maybe unusual but like feeling shame in a context where your body is involved is like not not in any way an unusual uncommon experience that's very normal so it feels good to like kind of share that and be able to see that from sharing it with you yeah yeah I mean I think what you're saying is is so true that like you have really good words for this and you have really good in touchness with your body and your emotions and um I was just looking back at like this exchange you had on Twitter a while ago where you like you asked people to roast you it was like that thing that was going around and I made a joke about how like there's something sometimes I'll ask you how you're feeling about something and like within like you'll you'll reflect on it for like two seconds or less and then you will list like five different ways you're feeling about the thing and it's just I, I know that it's like incredibly accurate like I know that you have that level of like just rapid fire introspection but it's so fucking cool and like it's just not not something that most people are able to do so I do appreciate that like you you have the ability to like um feel into all of this but like with a lot of granularity and also just yeah talk about it on your on your this podcast platform that you have I admire that a lot Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah like shout out to Doug and Ali and the Tatarans for the biomotive because I think it's just like that that skill is just like purely reps on biomotive just like having done that a whole bunch and yeah. it's funny I thought of that too that compliment that you've given me before recently because I forget what it was but someone asked me a question about how I was feeling that took me like 40 seconds to answer <laughs> it was like took a long time I was like oof this is new stuff I've not felt this before it was like conspicuously long compared to the usual so I thought of that recently as well nice yeah 40 seconds 40 a personal seconds. record <laughs> yeah personal record yeah well it used to be I mean that's why I like really shout out again to the the Tatarans because it, it like I did not have that fluency and it like the skill very much comes from not having had it before so Right. Uh, right. It's such a relief yeah. that that's like a learnable skill that you can get in touch with your emotions and be able to speak them. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, maybe changing gears slightly, uh, the, the other sort of dimension that I wanted to talk about from living together is like very different object level, but I feel like also very similar with like the underlying themes is it was so sweet to see you in person with Nyla and, um, you know, I, I feel like really I've had a relationship with Nyla since I first heard about her and you sent me pictures of her and like we've done calls, but like actually living with her was was incredible and um, seeing you with her really confirmed this sense that I've had for some time of like, um, that your relationship with her is like not the way that most people relate to their pets or their dogs is in a way that's like, I think this is a theme as well in our friendship. Like sometimes you'll like thank me or I'll thank you for something in our friendship. That's like, like, yes, this is rare, but it shouldn't be rare. This should be super normal that like, oh, like we listen to each other. <laughs> like, you're like, thank you so much for listening to me. I'm like, well, yes, of course. Like you deserve to be listened to. And like, this should be like, you shouldn't have to thank me for this. Like I'll take the thanks, but like, this should be normal. And so similarly, it's like, it's not like, um, I don't know, it shouldn't be special that you love Nyla the way you do. It shouldn't be something that I'm like noticing as unusual, but it is unusual. And so it almost makes me want to 
like dive into the things that I saw and like ask you about your relationship with her. I've talked to you a fair bit about this, but I don't think you've talked about it on on record before. And like, I think that would be really good for the world because most people don't love their pets and dogs the way that you do. And that comes out in just so many ways that are like small, big, the way that you relate to her. And it, it, almost, it almost feels like, to me, it feels inappropriate to use the word like pet or dog with Nyla. It's like, no, she's your mm-hmm. friend. Like she's one of your best friends and you love her. And like, it, like she happens to be a dog and like, she's not like, you don't, you, she's not like your pet, you know, like you two have a, a relationship that's like really, I think like mutuality and, and love there that I see there. That's, that just doesn't really fit the typical use of those words. And um, yeah, that's just something I would love to hear you talk about and uh, learn more about and, and really like share with the world because I think people people could use that and like the animals that are in our lives could use that mm. yeah thanks for reflecting all of that um it makes me feel very seen in my relationship with her it really does feel to me like there's a whole soulmate thing going on there mm. that um sometimes I'm a little hesitant to like like if somebody comes over and they're not really a dog person, then I try to like tone it down a little bit because I'm just like, okay, I'm just gonna like come across as a crazy dog lady. But uh, oh. it feels seen oh. to like, uh, yeah, I feel seen. So thank you. Um, it's not you that's crazy. It's the world that's crazy, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, where should we start? You know, it's funny. I think this is one of those situations where like, I mean, I don't know what your experience is like, but often people don't even see the things that they do. And like, right. um, there were so many things that I saw from living with you and certainly from being your friend for some time, but like, it was really acute from being in the same space of like things that I saw you do or ways that I saw you behave that just seemed, um, and, and you know, this is one of my hobby horses, but like, one of my biggest concerns that's closest to my heart is like speciesism basically where people see animals and plants as like inferior to humans and less than humans. And that I think is like intimately tied to like the conditions on the planet that are problematic. And um, you were demonstrably like not that and basically saw Nyla as a person worthy of love and respect in so many small and big actions and maybe it would maybe it would be helpful to just start by like reflecting some of the things that I saw um and then like I would be interested to hear you talk about them and um kind of riff on that yeah so she's she turned five recently I've had her since she was about six months old so we've been together about four and a half years and um it's been this like fascinating journey together. She, um, so she was five or six months old when I got her and I had wanted to a German shepherd or a part German shepherd. And I found her online in like the area where I was living at the time. And she was clearly mixed with something bigger than German shepherd, but I didn't know what, I didn't know exactly how old she was, but she was like a 60 pound puppy Mm. with huge feet. It's 60 (laughs) pounds at five or six months is Mm. a lot. (laughs) And she, she looked pretty undernourished too. So like probably should have weighed more than that at the time. But like, so like I had this idea intellectually that she would get very big, but I did not really understand like this really what it means to have a giant dog. And like, she is 130 pounds now. And uh, she's part German Shepherd, part Doberman, part Great Dane and some other stuff. But there are breeds that are known for like, they can get pretty aggressive pretty spirited um if they don't have like the proper training or even sometimes if they do and plus she has you know an unknown background as a rescue but anyway all this to say that like she ended up having some behavior problems surface pretty early on like um around like nine months to a year and she was getting really big which like behavior problems from a chihuahua are very different from behavior problems from a 130 pound dog you know just the standards are different rightly so and um yeah I was living in an apartment building in DC where like there were dogs and people everywhere and all these like tight 
corridors and um, blind turns and things. So just situations where like things that were triggering for her were all around us all the time. Um, and it was rough. It was intense. It was um, it was stressful. It was difficult. There were a lot of times like I, I don't think I had the emotional awareness to describe things as triggering for me before. And I would use that word now, but basically like I was being triggered constantly. She was being triggered constantly. Things were difficult a lot of the time. It was sort of like this, like oftentimes us feeding off of each other too, in terms of the triggers. I think like I would be nervous about who were, what was about to happen as we we're walking down the hallway and like, was a dog about to pop around the corner and dogs are so like energy aware and, and sensitive to people's emotions around them that that probably she would take that in, think there was something to be nervous about. It's just, we would escalate each other's stuff all the time. And um, yeah, it just feels very much like she and I have been on this journey together of like, it's sort of like we have similar triggers. We have similar um, things that we don't like. Neither of us love loud noises or like places where there are big crowds and lots of stimulation and um I feel like we've done a lot of healing together in that way like um I talked about this a little bit in Chow Chi's podcast and um I might have talked about it in our first podcast but like the sound of her barking she's a really loud deep bark and that was like one of the things that started a lot of my whole like emotional healing journey was trying to manage the stuff that was coming up for me when she would do her like biggest loudest most frightened barks um because it's like it just really shook me out of like my my habits at the time and like things that I could otherwise avoid and pretend weren't happening you know I was just I was the caretaker of another being and I was too panicked or triggered or any other number of emotional states very often to actually be able to be there for her like I yeah it was this odd scenario where I was like I've never loved anybody as much as I love her and also I feel like I'm acting in ways that are like not in line with that very often like what is happening that I'm just always so annoyed or frustrated or angry or scared and like I can't really take good care of her how can I be there for her and comfort her and tell her that like she's safe and there's nothing to be afraid of if my whole body is in a panicked state and so um it was very much a situation of like things are going on that I don't really understand, but something is wrong with me and I need to work on that so that I can be there more fully for her. And I think that, um, yeah, who knows what would have happened if I, if, if she and I hadn't come together that way, if I would have, maybe other things would have prodded me into like getting, getting started on the emotional healing journey, but, but um, who knows? So that feels like it's been, a really solid anchoring point for me you know like values have changed over the years um spirituality my approach to spirituality and teachers and writers who resonate for me and all that that like changes a lot but something that I've really anchored in over these last however many years is like um how do I show up for her lovingly the most the most fully the most often um when something's pulling me out of that, that is what needs to be addressed. That's where the work is. And um, it's gotten a lot better. It's like, it's not perfect. I still get triggered. Certainly there's like, it, it's so funny. It feels like she is built to, <laughs> there are two specific noises that she makes that feel like they get to some of my deepest core things. One of them is her really loud, deep bark. And it like, there's been all of this like fear related stuff that it's brought up for me and the other one is like there's a a specific kind of whine that she does and it's like it's pretty common for German shepherds actually I've noticed it being around other German shepherds it's like they tend to just be very vocal dogs and they want to like talk to you a lot and like one of the noises that they like to use to like communicate with people is whining and there's like all these different things that Nyla might mean when she whines but there's something about the like specific tone of that sound that like brings up this like really deep intense like shame and guilt in me and um Jane would you mind just not covering your mouth because it's it's sort of changing the sound 
Oh, it's funny that you said that about the noise as a motorcycle went by and so I couldn't really hear you, but did you say not cover my mouth? Yes, please. Cool, yeah. Um, so yeah, it feels like in those ways, she's like uniquely good <laughs> at bringing up some of my deepest stuff. And so it's like a really good anchoring point is like, how do I work with all of the triggers that come up, all of the emotional stuff that comes up with her so that I can like show up for her most fully because um yeah having having like a dependent being I mean I have no idea what it's like to be a parent and I'm not gonna claim that this is like that but like having a being who depends on me is a lot different from like having a friend that I care about a lot but we're like sort of like mutually independent and autonomous um mm. so yeah it feels just like a duty I guess is to clear out all of the stuff in me that I can in order to like love her more fully and show up for her really fully and be able to take care of her emotional needs as much as I can. Mm. Mm. I don't know. I think like that's, that's just, again, such an example of like, there's things that you would say or do that just feel um, like so right and so appropriate. It's like, yes, like, actually, you are correct. You have a duty to her to, like, heal the things within you. And yet that's something I've never heard anyone say before, um, that, like, there, there's the duty to heal those things so that you can love her more fully and be there for her and take care of her better. And, like, I think, yeah, I think probably I've heard things like that with people talking about their children. But um, I don't know. Maybe other people have felt this before, but uh, it's not, like, it's certainly just rare in any case. And, um but there were sp certainly specific things that I saw you do that were just like, oh, that is so loving and so appropriate and fitting and also very rare. And um, mm. what you shared, I wonder, like, what's the question? It's something like, how, yeah, how did you realize that you needed to heal yourself emotionally in order to be there for her? And like, what did you start to do to work on that like I know you did a bunch of emotional healing work but like yeah how did how, when you started to like what how did you realize that that you needed that and then like when you did realize that and you started to do the work how did you shift your relationship with Nyla yeah there was just stuff that I was doing as um if we're going to use the ifs language i think this is what you would call protector parts are protector parts and ifs parts that get you to do things to like so that you're not getting triggered as much it's like protecting your triggered parts yeah. is that right and it can come out in like really bad ways right is that like um yeah basically i was acting in really ugly ways sometimes or ways that i didn't recognize as myself and ways that i didn't understand and i just couldn't like i couldn't say with that it was like a you know it's like one of those like turning points in life where for me at least i can look back on like a couple specific times where i noticed myself getting into patterns that just felt inexcusable and it's like okay i don't understand what's happening here do i like let this keep happening or do i change course and like something has to change here because like my sense making of it now is like these incredibly deep unprocessed fears were getting triggered that like I didn't actually have the capacity to just like feel and experience at the time and so my protector parts are just like anything that you can do to get that noise to stop do because something terrible is about to happen and so whether that would be I mean like I was working with a dog trainer at the time and his advice was like get her, call her over to you, you know, get her to sit, lay down, you know, like do these other things that will like distract her, make her feel like, you know, she's got work to do and tasks to do and she can get some treats and like she'll stop barking and it'll, you know, there's sort of like other way of managing it. And like at times I was doing that, but it still felt like something was wrong here. I shouldn't have to force her not to bark for one thing. And like, I'm, I'm kind of glossing over. There were, like, there were times that I yelled at her. There were times I just behaved in ways that I like really, really didn't like. And, but did also didn't feel like I had any control over. It was just like something 
it just happened. And then I was just racked with shame after and, and guilt and just like reeling and wondering what had happened. And mm-hmm. I could kind of manage it with the training tricks and things, but it felt like, okay, but what if I like can't get her to stop sometime or like, why does it, why does she have to be suppressing her fear response because I can't handle it? Um, it just, and also it was just showing me, it was like tapping into some really deep stuff that I didn't realize was there before. And it, it, it felt like something that I, I needed to like understand and dive into. It felt very important. And so I started doing I mean, there's a lot of stuff kind of all unfolding at the same time. I just think I was starting to get really good massages. Then I was getting really involved in the Twitter community where people were talking about healing all the time through the Twitter community. I found a really amazing shadow work specialist. And the first thing that I worked with was like, why am I having panic responses with these really loud noises? Oh, it's probably also worth mentioning. There were like, for one thing, I wasn't talking about it for some number of months when it first happened because I was just so embarrassed by it like I didn't really know about trauma I didn't think that I had trauma at all and like I it was just so embarrassing to me that like I couldn't handle the sound of my dog barking it was like it feels sort of like what you're describing before of like something is just like really wrong with me and it's really embarrassing and Mm -hmm. like I I don't know how to like talk to people about like something that feels this shameful of like I'm crying because my dog is barking like it just it made me feel really Mm. like pathetic and broken and I think there were ways that I was around that time I moved out of DC and I moved to Asheville somewhere much quieter and somewhere I didn't have to live in an apartment building and I could like be somewhere where we could just step outside and like go for calm quiet walks you know and like I also really wanted to do that for other reasons but like it probably more than I cared to admit at the time it was like me trying to run away from triggering situations without like fully fixing it so like if I can figure out a way for her to be getting triggered less often and and as a result me to be getting triggered less often like maybe I can like arrange my life in a way where that's happening way less and then I won't have to look at this as directly um and I'm I definitely don't think that was very conscious at the time, but I think it was like informing my actions um, in a shadowy sort of way. Um, Yeah, doing that shadow work. Let's see, I'm trying to remember the next part of your question. Like once I started doing that type of emotional work, what shifted in the relationship? Yes, yeah, like how did the way that you interacted with Nyla change? I think just like the percentage of the time that I can like be present and loving with her is just like, has just increased so much. Um, And my own ability and confidence, like my own just like love and trust with myself and my, my acceptance of the fact that like stuff that comes up, it's not like some fundamental flaw in me. It's some emotional reaction that I'm having for a reason and it can be worked through and it can be addressed and it's okay that it's happening. Um, So now like there's still plenty of things that happen where like, uh, yeah, I get like triggered in a smaller big way. And I feel like I do, I, I actually take the space too to not like be with her because I don't think it's right to be in the middle of an intense emotional response and be trying to like act like, I have everything under control and I can actually be loving towards her. It feels off and like the like oxygen mask metaphor in an airplane of putting on your own before helping someone else get theirs on. Like I still will take a minute to like go separate myself and like be with my emotional stuff and try to work with it. But over time, for sure, like the amount that I can just stay grounded and calm and in my heart and, um, and be with her is just like increased so much. And, um, yeah, I just feel much more present with her in general. Like, it's not just when something that comes up that's triggering. It's like being able to walk down the street and like be on a walk with her. And like, we're just like really on a walk together. Like, we're like really just like being with each other. And like, she's smelling the flowers. And I'm like, oh, Nyla's smelling the flowers. How, how, are the fl- how do the flowers smell right now? Like, what's going on for Nyla? We're just both out walking down the street, smelling the flowers. And like, um, yeah I don't want to like I feel like mindfulness is just talking about that feels like fraught with all this other stuff like um but doing an 
uh, doing a lot of emotional processing and what feels to me like clearing out a lot of space that allows for more presence. Um, yeah, it feels like it allows me to be there for her emotionally a lot more and also just be there with her day to day mm -hmm. a lot more. Um, yeah. That makes sense that you're very present with her. And I think the other thing that I really see that seems like a root of a lot of specific behaviors that I saw you do that again, seem like unusual, but just like very kind and they shouldn't be unusual. But um, I think they're rooted in, in basically theory of mind where you're like, oh, I have a sense of who Nyla is and what she's feeling and what she needs. And you like can act in accordance with that and make decisions in accordance with that. and um I don't know does that resonate for you that you at all yeah I don't notice it as much like I don't I don't notice it so much specifically with people and animals but I notice it just a lot in general like wow that person really cannot model what it's like to be a different person with different experiences and different like yeah different emotions and different tendencies and things but um, I wonder how much of that is sort of like natural tendencies that we have towards that. I also think of doing a lot of your own emotional work and processing and healing as creating a lot more space that theory of mind then like has access to. Like, I think that being less habitually triggered or like less frequently triggered makes that even like available to us to like, mm -hmm. Like when you and I talk, I feel like um, we can hold space for each other in a way where like we can really be curious and interested in what the other one is going through and be in that space for a long uninterrupted time. Whereas like sometimes with people I'll notice that like they can't help but bring it back to themselves. And it's like, I don't think it's some kind of like just like self-obsession or something. I just think there's these ways that people get triggered and it's like, it, but maybe an emotional trigger that manifests as a thought or a question or something where they have to kind of pull it back to themselves and then maybe they'll like write themselves or remember and try to come back to you or something but like I do really think that doing a lot of healing work just seems to like the less often you're getting unnecessarily triggered like there's just so many benefits of it including just having way more presence being able to be there for other people when they're hurt or or triggered or um just really being able to have a deep curiosity about other people and what their experience is like and how to model that experience and, and how to be there for them specifically with those experiences and the love languages and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. That makes sense. I think. Yeah. I think the healing opens that up. I think there's something like developmental too about it of like yeah, I don't know. I, I was just kind of learned to expect that most people of like certain ages aren't going to be able to interact in that way. And like, it's like not all adults will be able to interact in that way. But it was just, I don't know, it's so, um, I don't it, it's moved me to tears many times to like, watch you interact with Nyla or hear you interact with Nyla because uh, Yeah, you just, you treat her with a respect that I think everyone is worthy of, including animals. And it's, and then it, that reminds me of how rare that is. And I mean, um, I remember, um, I don't know, like as soon as I saw you, um, like before I, yeah, like I, I flew in to see you and you texted me before and you were like, oh, um, I forget exactly how you said it, but like meeting a new person is like kind of a big thing for Nyla. And so if you could just stand where you are in the place where we're meeting and I'll come up to you with her. Like that was so thoughtful. And um, you also said like before that you were like, yeah, we're we're gonna come and meet you, you know? And like, I, I, I know for certain most people in that situation would say like, oh yeah, I'll come, I'll come to meet you. And it just happens that my dog is coming with me or like, oh, I'll come with you with my dog. But it's like, no, you're like, we're coming to meet you. Like, like we're, you know, like she's a person too and we're coming to see you. Like, it, it'd be so weird if like, you know, um, say you and I, like you, you and Chris were, I was going to meet you and Chris, for example. And you were like, yeah, I'm going to come see you. And Chris happens to be in the car or like not even mention Chris at all. And then Chris is there. And that's like what most people do with their dogs. Or I remember as well, um, 
you left for a few days when we were living together to like travel elsewhere and you were just like so thoughtful about what Nyla would need during that time and like um what like how to make sure that she would have a good experience even though you're gone and like um I don't know it's like I think most people would be like oh yeah like feed the dog at this time and like take them for these walks but like you're really thinking about like her emotional experience and how she could feel safe and like what she would need to feel safe that wasn't just like physical necessities or something like that and um yeah there was just like so many things like that that were just very thoughtful about her and like um they're not even that like when you have theory of mind it's not even that like mysterious it's like oh yeah like of course this other person is going through this kind of an experience it's not like magic or something but just seeing that applied to uh nyla was just so it has so consistently been very touching for me Hmm. that's so sweet to hear thanks for saying it Mm -hmm. yeah there's something about like um Recently, I've been in New Mexico for a while, and recently she and I went to California to San Diego for a couple weeks to visit a friend, and we were driving in a car that didn't have AC, and it's like pretty much desert the whole way, and it was manageable for me and like not not great for her. She's like really a cold weather dog. She has really, really thick fur, and yeah, just like all of the guilt that I had resulting from that, I realized that like... um, in terms of like holding space for humans, for loved ones, for friends and family, it's like, it's one thing where I feel like I can be very compassionate for people, but like really also recognize that like everyone's emotions are sort of like their own responsibility. And like, I don't need to take on other people's feelings. And I feel all of this like very important separation there. Like the the balance between holding space for other people and supporting them without taking responsibility for their feelings or like, um, really being clear sort of like about the autonomy there but it's just very different with her because she can't make these like sort of decisions and I'm making all of the decisions for her all the time not all of them I I try to like allow her to be as sovereign as I can and that's like that's a whole other interesting thing about having a pet is like how to find a balance there where like you're letting them be themselves as much as possible but like also trying to like live in a society and like, you know, where there's rules about putting leashes on dogs and like other, I also want other people around to feel safe, you know, people who have dog phobias and stuff like a 130 pound dog is probably going to scare them more than a chihuahua. But um, yeah, I just think about this a lot. How like, if, you know, I decided to travel during that time and if it were up to her, she, you know, if she and I were like having a conference about whether I should travel. She might, she might like, not do we want have to, to drive through the desert. That's going to be really hot, Jane. Like, could we just not do that? <laughs> right, right, right. And like that, that trip, I actually felt really good about, like we were in San Diego for two weeks and it's a friend of mine who she has known for a long time and they're very close and like it's just a really dog friendly place and she got to go in the ocean like I'm really glad that I took her and I think it was a great trip for her but also just this feeling of like um yeah I am the one like managing this whole experience I'm the one who made you know planned the trip of going in this car like through the desert for a recreational trip that wasn't totally necessary so like when she's suffering like you know it's it's very important to like yeah just like really take on the responsibility that I'm the one managing these these experiences and kind of always like weighing the pros and cons for her and um yeah same thing when I travel like when 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 you watched her for me um it meant a lot to me that you were willing to do that because there's just like a lot of kind of quirky and specific stuff about taking care of her. And, um, there's it, it, I, it's hard to find people who I feel like really, 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 uh, safe and secure leaving her with. And so that meant a lot to me, but yeah, there's, um, I don't know. I think everybody's experience all the time is important. Everyone's well being, everyone's emotional experience all the time is important and we shouldn't like, um, nobody should be more important than anyone else's and obviously there's like a lot of a lot of horrible suffering in the world all the time and that's all very important too and how do we decide what we like what time and energy we direct in what ways but this is you know my dog my 
soulmate, my buddy, my pal who I live with and who I have really great power in like impacting what her emotional experience is all the time. And so why not like take that incredibly seriously? Hmm. Hmm. Definitely. Definitely. That was a real, real privilege to be with both of you. So just grateful for that time. It was really sweet watching you two um, just like develop such a deep bond. I mean, yeah, I love watching her like develop relationships with people. It feels worth mentioning we're having this whole conversation about her. Like she's a deep dog. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, there's like dogs are, are there's so much range in personality and, and stuff. And like she is a soulful dog mm-hmm. with a lot of personality and there's so much to her and there's a lot going on emotionally there. And mm-hmm. um just a huge heart. Uh, and, um, so I don't know, some dogs, I feel like I can develop these very deep bonds over time and the relationship changes a lot and stuff. And other dogs, I feel like it's a more like consistent bond or it feels a little shallower, just Mm -hmm. if you don't get to those deep places, but it was really cool to watch you guys just like over the course of that time, just get really close and really get to know each other. And, um, have some very cute pictures of her cuddling in your lap <laughs> as uh-huh. much as she could fit in your lap. And, uh, uh-huh. Yeah. Just uh, very grateful to you for treating her with all the love and respect that you did. Mm, definitely. I felt like, um, you know, she, I mentioned before with people that she's my easy to love animal. I always start my meta sessions with loving her and it, it I, you know, no proof of this hard to know for sure. But in my subjective experience, when I met her in person, like she absolutely knew how much love I had for her and that I had sent her <laughs> love before. And she was like, ah, I have felt this person's love before. Like no doubt about it. Like that's how I experienced meeting her in person was, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> That would not surprise me at all if that were the case. It totally fits with my experience as well of yes. seeing you two together. Yes, so sweet. <laughs> I I um I spent a lot of time. I did a retreat recently and spent a lot of time sending both of you meta. And um, I would imagine um, I, I like I, I would spend like dedicated sessions spending sending meta to Nyla in particular, and uh, I would imagine like memories of being with her and. Um, like kind of kneeling next to her and like petting her behind her ears and just telling her like how much I love her and like speaking to her and that just like without fail melts my heart and just like oh, oh, there it is so so much love for her she's such a sweetheart yeah yeah mm. anything else you think would be fun to talk about hmm I don't know. I think that feels really good on my end. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. That, that part of the conversation about her, that was super sweet. Definitely. Definitely. Mm. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk. I, I really love this conversation and uh, it's enjoyable for me and really think that these talking about these things is of benefit too. So thanks for your time. Yeah. Thanks for having me.